Well, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to this service of uh, Maldi Thursday. We're delighted to see you as we gather on this day of days, night of nights, as it were. Uh, we have been walking with Jesus, following Jesus all this week through his, um, on his way to the cross. And tonight we remember Christ and his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane at the supper around the table. And we are also going to be focusing on the next day when he was betrayed and tried and executed. Uh, all of that, part of this service tonight. So it's a, it's a solemn service. Uh, ironically, it's probably one of the most beautiful times of day in this sanctuary with the late afternoon light coming in, uh, coming in through these beautiful windows. And yet we are here to remember uh, something that happened uh, for us on our behalf and something that, that made things different for us uh, for the rest of our lives. And so let us worship God as we begin with our call to worship, a responsive call to worship, and just remain seated for all of this this evening, please. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. This is a day of remembrance for us. Throughout the generations, we have received and handed on to others what the Lord has given to us. Water for washing, the towel of service, Let us pray. O oh God, your love is embodied in Jesus Christ, who washed disciples' feet on the night of his betrayal. So wash us from the stain of sin, so that in hours of danger we may not fail, but follow through every trial and praise him always as Lord in Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
Our confession and pardon come next. Even among Jesus' closest disciples, not all were clean. On this night of nights, we confess the ways we disappoint, deny, and even betray Jesus, our teacher and Lord. Our confession of sin is made in the sure knowledge that Jesus is able to wash us in forgiveness and love. Let us pray together. Holy God, you have called us to serve others as Christ has served us, but we have not followed Christ's example as fully or as often. We turn away from people in need. True humility eludes us, and we hide from you. Lord, we have commanded to love one another as you have loved us, but loved you so generously. Gathered on this Maundy Thursday, we confess that we are capable of denying and betraying you and one another, no less than the first disciples. Forgive us, merciful God, and cleanse us of all our sin. Then guide our feet to walk with you always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is past and the new has come. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. First reading is from Exodus 12, 1 through 14. Let us hear now the word of God. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. 
You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. You shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Psalm 116, 1 through 2, 12 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. What shall I return to the Lord for all of his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord. In your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes.
And now John 13, 1 through 7, 31b through 35. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to you, to the Jews, now I say to you, what I am, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This ends the reading of God's holy word. To God be the glory, and let us look to God in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Well, this is a meditation. As such, it means that you and I are invited to reflect on what is said. What I have to say to you this evening is not, in fact, the whole truth of Holy Week. It is instead the truth for this night and for the morrow and for Saturday. It's the truth about the cross. I have borrowed quite heavily from the writings of Jürgen Moltmann, who wrote the book The Crucified God. So, for just these few moments, let us meditate on these thoughts. Moltmann said, quote, there are no roses on the cross. What he means by that is the cross is not the scene of life, but of death. The cross is not an encounter with glory, but an encounter with rejection. The cross is not a place of hope, but a place of despair. There are no roses on the cross. The cross is not bathed in sunlight. It's not surrounded by spotlights or footlights. It is hidden and obscure. It stands in the darkness and in the blackness of the night. It doesn't gleam or sparkle. It's not jewelry made of gold or silver. It's dull and cheap and wooden and cruel and crude. There are no roses on the cross. It's not a place of victory. A place where crowds cheer and throw ticker tape from high windows. It's not a place where medals are presented and heroes decorated. Nor is it a place where tears of joy and pride are shed as the faithful are honored. Instead, it is a place from which the faithful have fled. A place where there is no sound except the crude mumbling of a few bystanders and the loud, despairing words of the one hanging there. There are no roses on the cross. The cross is not the place where good is rescued. No one comes to the rescue, not Elijah nor the angels. It is a place where the one who hangs by his hands, whose head falls on his chest, is God himself. On the cross, God is crucified. The cross is not the place where we witness the glory of the church. It's not the place where the religion of humanity is confirmed or affirmed, where we worship 
with songs and anthems and fresh flowers and well-dressed people. Instead, it is the place where the curtain of the temple is torn from top to bottom, where worship is exposed for all its failure, all its failure to honor God. It is the place where corruption is revealed, where idols are struck down, where religion is discovered to be serving the spirit of selfishness rather than the spirit of God. The cross is not the place where faith is celebrated, where creeds are confessed and pledges are made to the doctrines of the church. It's not the place where saints kneel at the altars and whisper holy prayers. Instead, it is a place without sainthood, bleak and forlorn, a place where creeds or doctrines or confessions of confusion, disagreement, betrayal, where no one knows what to say, no one knows what to believe, because God himself is hanging there. So there are no roses on the cross. We sing the hymn, Were You There? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Who then has stood at the cross? Well, those in history in times past who suffered in unthinkable ways have stood at the cross. Those who died in gas chambers at Auschwitz and Buchenwald, those who died in wars, those who have died in this week's mass shootings, those who have died from poverty and hunger, they all stand at the cross. When do we stand at the cross? We stand at the cross when love has died. Love between husband and wife, parents and child, between friend and friend. When faith dies, when our faith dies, we stand at the cross when faith in oneself, faith in those closest to us, faith in what we believe, even faith in God. We are then at the cross. When hope dies, we stand at the cross, hope against illness and disease, hope for employment, hope for life. Which means that at the cross we are not brave, but we're frightened and desperate and anxious. We're overcome with doubt. We're unsure what to do and what to believe. We find no rescue, no courage, no victory. Only rejection we tremble at the sight of death and shiver in the darkness. There are no roses at the cross. It is from the cross, in fact, that the disciples flee. They don't want to be there. Death wins. Hope dies. A Messiah is rejected and forsaken. On the cross, it is finished. It is finished because... On the cross, the hour has finally come, and God knows what God is doing here. It, the hour has finally come when God redefines glory. On the cross, God also occupies the darkness. On the cross, God is vulnerable to the cruelty of the world. On the cross, God dies with the defeated, with those who are never honored, never rescued. God dies too when love dies, when hope dies, when faith dies. God lives with our lack of courage, with our despair, our fear, our trembling and rejection. God lives, lives with us in these very human moments that we have described. God is with us then. Can't we see that the cross is the ultimate moment of total oneness with God and God with us? God knowing fully how it feels to be human on the cross. God does not take us to the cross. Life takes us there. The world takes us there. We take ourselves there. On the cross, the word which was in the beginning, which was with God and was God, through which all things came into being, in which was life, and that life was the light of all people, the word that became flesh full of grace and truth, 
that word finally became all that it means to become human. So that when life takes you to the cross, you can know that you will meet God there. Where is God? God is on the cross. God is on your cross. Easter means nothing unless we first understand that there are no flowers on the cross. Only God, whom the cross could not contain. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our creed is from the brief statement of faith, let us say what we believe. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with outcasts, forgiving sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel, unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition. Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. The Lord said to Moses, this shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord. Paul says to the church, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. O Lord, our God, creator, and ruler of the universe, you made us in your image and freed us from the bonds of slavery. You claimed us as your people and made covenant to be our God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey. When we forgot your covenant, you spoke through prophets, calling us to turn again to your ways. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to your glory. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In humility, he descends from your heights to kneel in obedience to God's commands. He who is boundless takes on the bondage of our sin, he who is free takes our place in death's prison. He who is risen leads us to eternal life. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Church, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. 
And after supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. Body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup of our salvation, the cup of life. You each have your individual packets of communion, and as um, I partake of the bread here, I would invite you at this time to take the bread and to partake of the bread yourselves. And now the cup. Let us pray. God of grace, we give you thanks for the feast of redemption we have shared in the body and blood of our Savior. As you, as you have nourished us with love, let our lives proclaim your great love for the world. Through Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. And now grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you this day and all days. Amen.